you are tuned in to Monday Morning Missive number three. Which is uh, based on um, <clears throat> my uh, module number three of my uh, uh, musical history teaching aid, which you can find at davidrovics.com slash history. I'll start out with this song and uh... um yay I made it for the and then you got cut off but I, I imagine the broadcast and uh, yeah you're in time on time and in time and um, if everybody listening could uh, share this on Facebook or Twitter or someplace and let other people know that it's happening, that would be fantastic. Um, Ford built tanks for the Nazis, and the Nazis used those tanks to kill off lots of soldiers in the U.S. Army ranks. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist and a nasty one, was he? He built tanks for anyone for the proper fee. Henry Ford spoke to his lackeys and he said, isn't this great? We'll attack our enemies and we'll retaliate. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist and a cunning liar too. A brown bird with a swastika draped in red, white, and blue. Henry Ford spoke to his workers and he said, You dare not strike. You must be patriotic and take on my third right. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist and he had not a care about the dying soldiers that made him a billionaire. the Nazis, and he built many more, to kill off lots of peasants in Peru and Salvador. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist, I heard that when he died. The last words to leave his lips was, I bite my fry. The dollar was his icon, on whichever shore, and Henry's only motto was, make money and make war. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist, that's all I have to say, I will spit on Henry's rotting grave until my dying day. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist, that's all I have to say. I will spit on Henry's rotting grave until my dying day. And thank you for those who have just shared this and, um, and other people sharing would be most welcome. And, um, so, uh, yeah, I, um, uh, this, this module uh, that largely pretty much covers the 30s and 40s. And uh, 1930s and 40s. And uh, that last song is actually in the fourth module, but it's um, uh, basically because it's also about the 50s. But um, essentially, uh, that the reason it's in the fourth module is because some of these things could be in, in one or the other decade depending on you know which where how you want to emphasize things but um the ford motor company in 1952 sued i believe it was 52 going on memory there uh sued the u.s government for bombing their tank making facilities in germany and they won the lawsuit uh, for damages and um uh there's a lot of things that are generally misunderstood about um the Great Depression and uh, the Second World War, uh, and uh, one one of the things um, that's uh, often um, uh, misunderstood about the Depression, uh, uh, well, people often hold up uh, characters like uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt as being a, a great uh, socialist, uh, progressive type who wanted to lift up the American people out of poverty and start up all these uh, social programs uh, like the Tennessee Valley Authority and the, the uh, art projects and work projects, all kinds of things. And it's all true. I mean, these projects did 
it changed the lives of tens of millions of American people here in this country. Uh, they were uh, tremendous uh, programs that, that, that lift many millions of people up out of poverty and educated many, many millions of people and gave people work of all kinds, sometimes even meaningful work. And uh, yes, as, uh, as uh, has somebody saying, yeah, Roosevelt basically saved capitalism in the United States. And that's, that's the thing that's often misunderstood, which is exactly uh, true. Um, is that um, Roosevelt uh, would not have been nearly such a progressive if he hadn't been uh, pressured into doing these things by the circumstances of uh, the Depression. And, uh, and more than just the, the circumstances of the Depression. But for example, in 1931, there were 500 different incidences involving hundreds of people with weapons uh, uh, liberating the goods uh, from warehouses. Uh, so this was um, this was the atmosphere at the time. It was a potentially revolutionary atmosphere at the time in the early 1930s before Roosevelt came to power, but after the Depression uh, began. And then uh, in addition uh, to the influence of poverty and the Depression in terms of uh, pressuring Roosevelt to, to uh, try to do something about the dire situation for most American workers, there were also the twin examples uh, of fascism and, and communism, or at least what was being called fascism and what was being called communism. Of course, uh, you know, who defines these things? Uh, you know, uh, the, the, it's in, in the, the eye of the beholder or definer or whatever. But, uh, and of course, uh, in terms of uh, communism, uh, you know, most people would say, well, who, who, you know, there is no society that's ever achieved communism. But what we call, what we were calling communism, uh, which was what was going on in the United States, in, in the uh, in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, in the SS, USSR, and and what was being called uh, by both fascists and anti-fascist fascism, uh, that was uh, what was going on in Germany and Italy at the time uh, under the leadership of people like Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, and what was very clear. Uh, for many observers at the time about both what was happening in the Soviet Union and what was happening in Germany was that uh, both of these systems that were taking place in both of these countries were working a hell of a lot better than what was happening in the US or the UK at the time. Uh, many uh, first person observers uh, have said the same thing. I'm just going off of what they were saying in the 30s. People who were spending time in Moscow and Berlin and other big cities in those countries and saying, well, look, uh, there's, there's like full employment going on here in Moscow or in, in uh, you know, Germany, a uh, similar situation. And, uh, and I'm getting an interesting message, which I'm just going to, but who's he? Somebody, I think I missed something there. Uh, he, uh, yeah. Okay. Roosevelt he reminds me. Yes. Yeah, okay, I'm just gonna keep on going here. Um, but please continue to send messages. Very interested in any messages, questions, anything like that. Comments? Um, so, uh, yeah, so, but uh, so so there's there were these these examples of things being done much uh, differently and much better in in many ways in terms of uh, employment of people health of people uh, rather than uh, people living in tent cities in places like New York uh, or or you know, living in, in dire poverty and unemployment in places like Manchester in England uh, you had examples of of societies where there was full employment where people were, were getting plenty of sunshine and where exercise and good quality food and these kinds of things were happening in places like Germany um, and uh, Moscow at the time which was uh, which was um, a, a real challenge uh, for the uh, so-called democracies of the world and the uh, in countries like the United States and the United Kingdom and elsewhere uh, France uh, in these these democracies that were uh, doing such a bad job of taking care of their people uh, compared to the um, examples that I had just mentioned in Germany and Russia at the time 
um, you know, the, the people, the governments in these countries felt like they had to do something. In the case of Roosevelt uh, and the New Deal in the U.S., it meant uh, basically uh, mimicking uh, aspects of, of socialism uh, and uh, or, or, or de uh, developing essentially socialist programs um, and uh, in order to save capitalism, you know. Um, and... Uh, but it, we, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't think that, I mean, although these programs, the New Deal programs, were widely uh, popular among both Democrats and Republicans because they were seen as being absolutely necessary to save uh, society from uh, you know, potential violent revolution or to save you know, capitalist society. Um, and, and perhaps even, you know, those who were just concerned about ha making sure people could eat and you know, the reformists who genuinely believed in what they were doing. I'm sure there were plenty of those as well. But um, it, 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 you had also uh, a lot of people uh, that didn't think that this was the way to go, that didn't think that the New Deal was the way to go. And, and m most of these people uh, were not necessarily people that thought, oh, everything was fine before and we should just continue on the track we were going on before with, uh, with, with uh, essentially the you know, unregulated market capitalism, uh, essentially the age of the robber barons uh, continuing as was happening up until the 20s, really. There were a lot of people who thought uh, that there should be a, first of all, a lot of people who thought there, there should be a, a, a real a communist, socialist uh, or anarchist uh, revolution uh, in in the United States. A lot of people who who felt uh, very uh, strongly about that, including uh, loads of people who were organizing uh, in the labor movement and the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Not that they were organizing a revolution, but there were a lot of revolutionaries within uh, the CIO, um, and um, and and it was a, a real a real uh, volatile uh, period and. Um, there were also a lot of a lot of supporters of fascism, uh, including some very prominent people uh, that you have heard of, such as the uh, uh, old friend of some parts of my family, Charles Lindbergh, the uh, uh, famed uh, pilot who was the first uh, person to fly across the Atlantic, I believe. Um, and uh, the founder of the Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, who was a fascist, in fact, um, and funded pro-Nazi speaking tours around the United States, and uh, and was a big fan of eugenics, which is the pseudo-scientific uh, theory that uh, you know Jews are inferior and black people are inferior and all this, and. Um, and there were a lot of uh, fascists in the United States. Um, in the 30s and in the UK and in France and in many other countries around the world. And they were actively and vocally supporting Adolf Hitler and, and Benito Mussolini. And um, when uh, the United States entered World War II, which was very late in the war, years after it really began, um, th then, then the United States leadership claimed to be against fascism and claimed that anybody who was um, you know, uh, who, who, anybody who was, uh, you know, in the war effort for the United States was against fascism and had always been against fascism. Uh, very reminiscent of, of like uh, George Orwell's 1984, where the propagandists are saying uh, uh, Oceania uh, is against East Asia and has always been against East Asia. And you know, don't mention the alliance uh, that was just there yesterday. You know, just talk about history as if it's always been this way. And, um, that was the line at the time. Like we're against fascism. We've always been against fascism. Let's go kill the fascists. You know, let's not talk about how so many of us were and are still fascists. And then as soon as the war is over, we're going to be uh, pro-fascism again, and, and we're going to be uh, talking about how scary the Reds are, even though it was the Reds that primarily are the ones that defeated fascism, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later. But um, first, I'll do this song. The war, the, uh, the Second World War, uh, you know, it began at, a, at different times depending on who you talk to. Like, uh, um, and, um, but, uh, for the people of Spain, it certainly began in 1936. 
and um, the uh, um, the people that went from all over the world to fight alongside the international brigades in Spain against uh, the fascists that were running the Spanish government that had that had taken, launched a coup and had, had taken over uh, the ruling ruling of uh, much of the country when the generals launched a coup. Um, they they had support. The generals had support of, Fr of Franco. Uh, I mean, of uh, they were led by Franco. They had the support of Mussolini and Hitler in Italy and Germany, and they also um, had the support of a lot of other people around uh, the world, including uh, to a very large extent the United States and French uh, governments, who um, essentially collaborated with uh, the Nazis um, by. Uh, preventing the Republicans in Spain, the, the anti-fascist forces that were led by uh, the Republican government, the democratically elected socialist government of Spain, uh, they, um, the, uh, the United States and, well, France prevented uh, Soviet arms and uh, tanks from getting into the Republic uh, when they could have been useful, uh, there, thereby essentially allying themselves with the fascists, who were, of course, exporting lots of tanks into Spain, while uh, while France was preventing uh, the, uh, the Russians from doing the same, and uh, and the United States was supplying oil, uh, essential, very essential oil to to the fascists in Spain, which would would have been very it would have been very difficult for them to function without it because uh, you know, neither Germany nor France, I mean neither Germany nor Italy, uh, you know, uh, the fascist powers of the day had uh, access easy access to oil. This is also a problem for Japan. Uh, internationals that came from the United States to fight alongside the Republic in Spain were uh, became known as the Lincoln veterans, the Lincoln Battalion. There were two battalions actually, but Lincoln Battalion and the Washington Battalion. But the ones that survived were mostly from the Lincoln Battalion, so they're the ones we remember because people who survive get remembered more. They were old when I was young. Now they've all but passed away Now it's just a second-hand Memory of the day When from all around the world They sailed off to Spain Where they fought against the fascists Where so many men were slain Who will recall the days When they all stood side by side You could see the men who made the journey to join the 15th Brigade. When men of many nations, of most every creed and hue, Catholics and Protestants, atheists and Jews, joined together in the trenches to turn back the fascist tide. Now that the last Lincoln the working class of many nations joined in a desperate bid with what weapons they could find. They fought to save Madrid from Brussels and Berlin, Galway and London town. Who will recall the brigadistas? Who went to take the fascists down? There beside the Spanish people, even the figs and olives cried. Now that the last Lincoln veteran died.
Reich had the people, but the fascists had the tanks. But Il Duce and Der Führer deserve only some of Franco's thanks. Cause the fuel to move the armor came from the USA. And the men that they gunned down were from New York and Frisco Bay. Uncle Sam claimed he was neutral. Who will remember how he lied? Now that the last Lincoln veteran died. They say people get conservative the older that they age. They say that being radical is just a youthful phase, but the finest communist I've known lived to 95, and he spent his whole life striving for humanity to thrive. To forget these fallen heroes is something I cannot abide. Now that the last Lincoln veteran died, now that the last Lincoln veteran Um, when the Lincoln veterans, like my friend uh, Robert Steck, Bob Steck, uh, came back uh, from Spain, uh, they they were actually um, called uh, uh, premature anti-fascists. That was the uh, official term um, given to them by the U.S. Uh, government. It was premature anti-fascists um, because uh, to be an anti-fascist uh, before 1941 in the United States meant that you were basically a dangerous radical who had a brain, who could think for themselves. And uh, the, um, so, the, the thing is that uh, being against fascism uh, in the United States uh, or in many other uh, Western countries uh, was really an anomalous thing. It was uh, very unusual uh, because uh, really uh, what, what we what we call Western democracy really um, be, had a lot more in common uh, with fascism uh, than it did with uh, what than co with communism uh, that you know, which are often painted as these twin um, pillars of authoritarianism or something, which, uh, you know, thanks to Stalin and uh, many other folks in the, uh, what they call the communist world, uh, you know, we can, we can pin the, the term authoritarianism on uh, communists as well as fascists, and it sticks pretty well because there's been a lot of authoritarians um, in both uh, camps. Uh, but... Uh, there are big differences. Uh, uh, one is that the fascism is inherently uh, a corporate thing, pro-corporate, and it's mimicking socialism, whereas socialism is uh, authentically uh, not uh, pro-corporate, but actually trying to rule on behalf of the people. I mean, doing so to varying degrees uh, of effectiveness. Uh, but uh, this was the thing that the the rulers in places like the United States were particularly terrified of was socialism, was communism, was the idea that uh, privately owned corporations uh, running everybody's lives and making all the decisions uh, w was not the um, highest achievement of civilization, that there was uh, something that could be done, uh, that, that it could all be done far better. Uh, this was what was really, really scary uh, for the leaders of the United States. Uh, was this idea of socialism. Uh, the idea of fascism wasn't scary at all because um, 
because really, uh, the, you know, how, how had the United States been ruled uh, be, you know, prior to the New Deal, prior to Roosevelt? Um, let's remember that although in the 1930s, uh, the, the federal government under Roosevelt was, uh, was to a large extent primarily really friendly to the labor movement, uh, to the working class movement, to people that were trying to organize against uh, their dire uh, living conditions and working conditions at the time. Uh, prior to Roosevelt um, and after Roosevelt, but especially prior to Roosevelt, uh, the normal response of the authorities uh, when workers were trying to exercise their rights to assemble or uh, their rights to speak on the sidewalk, uh, to have uh, the most fundamental basic uh, exercises of their rights to free speech, literally standing on a soapbox on the sidewalk. Uh, they were beaten and arrested. This is what happened when you tried to do these things in the United States prior to Roosevelt. You were beaten, you were arrested, you were tortured, you were sometimes killed. That is what, uh, th those are the consequences of, uh, those were the consequences of exercising your so-called First Amendment rights, was uh, beatings, torture, death. Uh, this sounds a lot like fascism, doesn't it? Um, I would challenge anybody to find a real clear distinction between uh, things like uh, the, uh, the Night of the Long Knives in Germany in, in 1933 and the... Um, if memory serves, and uh, the Palmer raids in the United States in 1919. I would say it's very much the same sort of thing. Uh, and uh, and it's not just that kind of similarity of this kind of authoritarianism, but uh, but also in the United States and the UK and other countries. Anti-Semitism and racism was fundamental and very popular. Um, uh, and uh, the way that this anti-Semitism and racism uh, uh, t demonstrated itself in places like the United States, particularly, uh, is first of all, we had a whites-only immigration policy until 1965. That's racist, uh, fundamentally. Um, but uh, not only did we have a whites-only uh, immigration policy, as did many other countries in the racist Western world, uh, but uh, we also um, uh, we we also we we also had uh, quotas for refugees. Um, so even if it was people who clearly were fleeing uh, persecution and in, in, in fleeing for their lives, uh, they uh, were not given preference uh, in the United States. Uh, to, to get in. Uh, sounds very similar. Uh, really, uh, Trump and Roosevelt have a lot in common, and, and I think uh, Trump and Roosevelt have a lot more in common than a lot of people uh, would care to admit. Uh, Roosevelt was didn't use words like shithole, as far as I know. He was much more, uh, you know, well-raised. His mother was English. I mean, you know, he was a, he was a polite kind of guy. However, um, the, the way that history has painted uh, Roosevelt um, as this, you know, basically angelic figure is, is completely distorted and wrong. Uh, yes, uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, was against fascism, at least, you know, enough to, to believe that it was important to fight a war against Germany and, and win. Uh, but, um, but uh, in terms of... Um, the question of, of uh, you know, later on, uh, wars often are explained by, like, well, we had to fight fascism because we had to save the Jews. Uh, they were all being killed. Well, I, I think you'll find that uh, if you look at the historical record, um, there were certainly a lot of people who were very concerned about the Jews being killed en masse, uh, and a lot of people who sacrificed their lives to try to prevent that from happening or try to uh, save some lives, sometimes a lot of lives. Uh, but uh, there was not a lot of concern um, here in the <clears throat> in the United States among the political leadership like Roosevelt. He was aware because there were people who were concerned. There were some people who were concerned. Uh, Roosevelt was well aware that the Holocaust, uh, the Nazi Holocaust, the slaughter of millions of Jews and the slaughter of millions of German communists and various other elements of German society and European society, 
uh, Roosevelt was was well well aware that, that this was happening. Um, it had been um, the evidence had been provided to him uh, very clearly, uh, but um, it was not until 1944 that the quota on uh, European Jewish refugees was lifted. So. Uh, which was way too late. I mean, the, the war was just about ending. Uh, Nazi Germany had pretty much been defeated. It was their defeat was 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 clearly going to be happening, uh, and this was understood after the German army had to retreat from Stalingrad, from what is now Saint Petersburg. Uh, this was clear in 1943 when the siege of Stalingrad failed, and and the German army was retreating and freezing and dying. <laughs> It wasn't until a year after that, a year after Sweden gave refuge to the Jews, finally. Um, a year after that, uh, the U.S. did. Um, it's, it's kind of reminiscent of the fact that the Civil War, the American Civil War, uh, decades earlier, had been already going on for years before... Uh, the United States government passed the Emancipation Proclamation emancipating slaves not only in the South but also in the North. It was years before uh, that proclamation was passed. So, you know, it's, it's another one of those things where, you know, yeah, was Lincoln out to liberate the slaves? Well, you know, maybe that wasn't his primary motivation, certainly at the beginning. And certainly Roosevelt's primary motiva motivation for fighting fascism in Europe really had nothing to do, nothing to do with saving Jews or other people that the fascists were, were killing. Because if the U.S. was concerned about saving the Jews, uh, there's a lot of other things they could have done, aside from declaring war on Germany in 1941. They could have taken refugees long before then. But this is what the English language press was saying about these Jewish refugees back in 1939 and thereabouts. But this is specifically about 39 because there was a boat called the MS St. Louis that uh, tried to get uh, 900 or 37 or so, I think, uh, Jewish, primarily Jewish, all entirely Jewish refugees from Europe were trying to get refuge in North America. First, they were turned away from Cuba, you know, pre revolutionary Batista Cuba. Then they were turned away from the United States, then they were turned away from Canada, and then they went back to Europe, and a fourth of the people on the boat died within two years afterwards. It's 1939 and the boats are coming, but we can't have them here. That much at least is clear. Our economy is poor. We can't just open up the door. We've got problems of our own. They should just leave us alone. They're a tribalistic race. They keep a separate space. They don't really integrate. They'll be a burden on the state. Watch before it is too late. It's 1939 and the boats are coming. But if we let them land, we ask to their demands We'll soon be overrun Our Christian country will be done They should just take the tram Closer by to Amsterdam Keep their problems in the region This invading legion Enemies within their ranks With names like Rosenberg and Frank Watch that water that you drank It's 1939 and the boats are coming must stay away. In the newspapers they say they don't believe in Christ the Lord, and they're jumping overboard, crossing borders in a swarm. They'll never be reformed. It's a Trojan horse attack, and we've got to send them back. There may be Nazis in the hall, answering Hitler's call. These Jews are Germans after all. It's 1939 and the boats are coming. Um, I'm just having awkward pauses after I sing songs because I'm, I'm so used to people um, clapping, you know, which doesn't happen online. 
Hello, Tom in Hamburg. Um, but clapping on the screen is nice anyway. Thank you. Busker unheard. Oh, good. Other people are clapping too. One of the really, uh, I mean, when I, there was a New York Times, a New York Times uh, journalist, um, he's like, I'm getting a, a message from my daughter who is watching the baby, and um, and she's wondering, is my broadcast still going? I'll just tell her, still, still happening, still, still going. She doesn't realize that I'm not just uh, singing songs the whole time, but I'm also talking. Um, and then, of course, how I would be able to respond to a text, I don't know. But anyway, she probably figured, if I don't respond, then I'm busy. I don't know. She's very smart. But um, when I read um, the uh, book by the... New, the former New York Times um, journalist uh, um, William Shiver. He wrote a book uh, called uh, the, uh, Rise and, uh, Rise the, no, "Rise and Rise and Fall the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich," and uh, wonderful book. I, I guess there's a lot of information that was discovered later, but from what he had to go on, which was a lot, given that he lived in Nazi Germany right up until the time that. Uh, it was not possible for a U.S. citizen to live there, and then covered the war and wrote about it extensively, and you know, yada yada. But um, you know, and it's and, and from him or from many other uh, authors, you could find the same thing, which was that, um, <clears throat> which was the, which was the fact that the the war. I mean, many people are are critical of the. Um, of the pact made between Nazi Germany and the USSR, uh, uh, you know the the uh, what is it, the Ribbon, Ribbentrop uh, Molotov Pact or whatever they call it, um, and uh, of course uh, the Soviet Union, uh, you know, while especially it, it, lots of uh, Trotskyists uh, and and various others will criticize the Soviet Union for uh, not uh, coming to the aid of the Spanish Republic as much as they could have, or for uh, many other uh, things when they, in terms of the idea of spreading uh, the revolution around the world and, and in terms of the idea of the Soviet Union trying to protect its own revolution rather than trying to spread uh, revolution around the world. Uh, there's a lot of these debates, these questions. Of course, the fact was that the Soviet Union knew that it was in, uh, you know, any, all the leaders who were paying attention knew that they were in a situation where they, the only way they could survive as a society uh, without an unbelievable bloodbath would be um, to prevent uh, uh, Germany from invading. And, uh, it, uh, which they, they tried to do. Um, of course, Germany ultimately invaded anyway. Uh, and, uh, I think um, the number of Russians killed um, are uh, were, uh, in the, somewhere around 20 million, just uh, some unbelievable number of, of uh, Russians were killed. It was a, I mean, so, so much of the, of the so, so many, uh, if not most of the people, I can't remember the numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's a, way up there in terms of the numbers of Russians and Chinese uh, that died uh, in the course of the Second World War. Really, they were they were the ones who died uh, for the uh, more than anyone. Um, but um, uh, at, at least as nationalities go. Um, but uh, the, the war itself uh, between uh, Germany and the Soviet Union uh, between the, the World War II, uh, the, the, in the European theater, as we say, uh, the, the war between Germany and the various other countries that were fighting Germany was mainly, militarily speaking, a war between Germany and the Soviet Union. And when, and when you just look at the numbers of tank battalions, and I can't remember uh, exactly, but it's something like, I think 
Germany had something like 105 tank battalions or something like that. I'm no, uh, you know, military guy, but I, I think it was something like 100 and something. And of those, over 90 were all, were on the Eastern Front. So it, is, it was overwhelmingly uh, a war between Germany and Russia. Uh, even when uh, D-Day was approaching and it was clear that uh, the Western uh, countries were going to be uh, coming in through France and uh, onto the West, uh, Germany could not afford uh, to hardly send any troops from the Eastern Front over to the West. They were still busy fighting on the Eastern Front the whole time uh, that uh, when, when the U.S. and Polish and British and French and other forces uh, were, were slowly uh, liberating uh, France and the Netherlands and um, countries in the West. Uh, the, the, the bulk of the battles were still happening on the East and uh, really um, the timing of the liberation of France and the Netherlands and such by the Western powers was uh, not, it was, a, 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 I'm quite certain, not a coincidence that um, Russia was already making progress in driving out the Nazis from Russia and from the East. And if Russia had not, uh, if, if the, United, the United States and Britain had not uh, sent troops in to Normandy when they did, uh, well, then, then uh, you know, you, you face the prospect of Western Europe uh, being liberated by the Soviet Union, uh, which was, in fact, the case in certain, in certain uh, incidences, like in Bornholm in Denmark. Uh, Bornholm was uh, liberated by Russians before uh, any Westerners got there. And... Um, and of course, um, this was also true of much of Germany, including the city of Berlin. And um, this is a song about one of the folks, uh, the grandmother of a friend of mine who was on a death march to Berlin at the time that the Russian troops came. Katerina Jakob, long before she took that name, was organizing workers in Hamburg just the same. Organizing beneath the flag of deepest red, a new dawn of peace and freedom clearly shining in her head. Katarina Jakob was acquitted of a crime, but the Gestapo had the last word. They weren't finished with her this time. She was sent to Ravensbrook, a killing hunger at her side. She heard of the execution, how her second husband died. For Katarina Jakob, the end was close at hand. She was on a death march with a ragged, starving band. Marching through a forest, being led by the SS. What would happen hours later seemed impossible. Yes. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katarina Jakob thought about her children and the friends and comrades taking care of them. Not knowing yet if any of them survive, not knowing that soon she'd see her daughters both alive. Katarina Jakob watched the German soldiers flee, streaming from the east, that's what she was seeing. Allied bombers flew above them, she thought they all might die, and then soon there was the silence of all the SS men. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katarina Jakob saw red flags flapping in the breeze above the Russian tanks, and she fell upon her knees. And so many 
different voices in so many different tongues sang the most beautiful song that could ever have been sung in German, Lithuanian, in Polish and in Dutch a myriad of melodies as never had been such in Russian and in Yiddish Italian and French emerging from the forest beneath the trench. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Falke hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht. Falke hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht. I thought I would uh, just um, close the segment with, oh, the German part gets better and better. Thank you so much. I don't know if that's true, but I appreciate the thought. I think my, my, uh, my ability to pronounce and speak German was best in the year 2000 or so, um, and it was never very good. But at that time, I was spending a lot of time in Hamburg. And uh, that's the closest I came to actually learning the language. But, um, um, I will, um, of course, the, the modules on uh, davidrovics.com slash history are longer and cover a lot more ground and a lot more songs uh, than these broadcasts. I'm just doing like one hour synopses or little, little, you know, picking pieces and stuff from the larger body of material. Um, and I thought I would just um, do one more and uh, for this broadcast. And, uh, and there seems to be a baby that needs some attention out there, but my daughter is taking care of him for now, very capably. But um, I, he keeps crying out there. But... Uh, <laughs> I will do uh, one more anyway. He stopped crying. It's okay. Um, it is uh, it is one of these phenomenons uh, in the world that um, history is generally written by the victors of the wars. Um, so we get to find out uh, their worldview and their reasons for fighting the wars and their uh, you know re explanation for why they won and their explanation for why they're better and the other ones that they were fighting are were the root of all evil and the reality of course is often much more complicated than that and um while it is unquestionably the case um that um that uh, nazi germany and the japanese empire uh as well as uh fascist italy were all doing terrible things um especially germany and Japan, uh, who were bigger and more terrible. <clears throat> um, there, no question about any of that, and, and history has very well uh, portrayed and uh, accurately and, and uh, in all of its, uh, well, not all, but in, in great detail uh, without pulling punches in terms of the horrors of what happened in the Nazi genocides and in the uh, Japanese occupation of China, which was uh, extremely brutal. And um, however, uh, it is the victors that paint the history, uh, that, that write the histories. And so we don't hear about uh, the fact that, uh, th that every member of the, uh, every leader of the, of the US military uh, of all the branches of the U.S. military, beseeched Roosevelt uh, to stop the bombing of Japan. 
uh, they were uh, telling him that the uh, that that Japan was completely uh, destroyed, that the industry was completely destroyed. There was no military purpose whatsoever in bombing the Japanese cities. Uh, the, the Mitsubishi factory, for example, in Hiroshima, had not received parts to be able to build anything in years. The embargo which the U.S. had launched against uh, the Japanese Empire back in the 1930s to prevent Japan from getting oil from Indonesia, which is an act of war, which is what provoked Japan to attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, the embargo, the U.S. embargo against Japan, had been successful. Japan was defeated in the, in, in the sense of having any possibility of of they never had a chance of defeating the United States and that was never the point they never had that intention they knew in the first place with a, a country their size an economy one-tenth of the size of the United States then they knew that the whole point in the first place was uh, in terms of the war with the United States was to uh, to play defense and but to do it so aggressively that eventually uh, through attrition uh, the United States would give up because the, uh, the, the calculation of the Japanese Empire was that they wouldn't, uh, uh, that the United States wouldn't be willing to fight uh, to, to such an extent, lose hundreds of thousands of, of uh, soldiers. Um, you know, that, that, that it turned out their calculations were incorrect and, and Roosevelt was, was uh, happy enough to sacrifice the lives of hundreds of thousands of young Americans to dominate Asia. But um, but anyway, uh, the, all the leaders of the U.S. military besieged Roosevelt at the time in the in 1944. Stop the bombing. Uh, there is no point uh, in in this. Uh, it is militarily uh, completely pointless. All we're doing is killing civilians. They said, essentially, and uh, and they said uh, that we will be uh, morally indistinguishable. I believe was the term they used from uh, the empire that we are uh, fighting against if we keep on killing civilians like this. Roosevelt's response was keep the bombing going. And further his response, although he didn't live to see it ultimately played out, uh, was to actively put all resources needed in, into the uh, nuclear weapons program in the United States. He was a big proponent of nuclear weapons as was uh, Churchill, after whom one of the bombs was named. And uh, I will just uh, close <clears throat> with the song about the greatest, most horrific war crime human beings have ever committed against other human beings. In the space of a day. 10,000 children Played in the playground Swinging on swings Didn't hear the sound Of the single plane That flew overhead The third shift workers Were just going to bed There was a flash of light And a rumbling Gone in an instant Parents, girls, and boys Ten thousand mothers Were boiling rice Three thousand prisoners of war Were rolling their dice Hoping they'd survive This terrible storm When each young uniform vanished in the air in the blink of an eye one moment they lived and the next they all died he rushed Each one of them thinking 
there might not be enough living so long with death everywhere much more than one person alone can bear but there wasn't time for a final kiss who could have known it did end like this he rushed he rushed a hundred thousand people were living their lives grandparents children fathers and wives now they're just shadows on the street in such a quick burst of incredible heat. Now listen to them talk about doing it again. From whence came the souls of this terrible men? He or she. Um, this concludes my broadcast, but I'm going to look at these messages here. And I'm, um, yeah, Ch Churchill ordered gas attacks on Iraqi rebels in the 1920s. That is very much true. And, uh, if you didn't know, um, And somebody from Greece sends out a message which is not worth repeating because they obviously have a strange black and white view of reality that uh, doesn't need to be uh, responded to. Um, <clears throat> but the question of whether I, um, somebody asked whether I, I support the DPRK, um, it is, uh, which is the uh, government of North Korea. Um, when we talk about support, I mean, the question of support uh, is, a, I mean, are we talking about um, supporting like everything that they stand for or are we talking about supporting their right to exist? If we're talking about supporting their right to exist, um, then uh, yes, I think uh, uh, the people of Korea and uh, North Korea, South Korea have uh, a right to exist and to self-determination and they should be able to work out uh, their own um, issues without the interference of the United States um, <clears throat> and uh, of course uh, the United States is the reason they have issues in the first place but uh, yeah no I, uh, I, I support uh, the United States getting rid of its military bases around the world and uh, cutting the military budget down to uh, just about nothing uh, that's what I support, you know, the U.S. getting out of the world and letting the world uh, evolve without the U.S. Uh, uh, trying to dominate everything. <clears throat> that doesn't mean I support the DPRK or, or, you know, other, I mean, you know, I have lots of problems with the government of North Korea. But uh, I don't, uh, I think... Um, the United States, what's clear histo from history is that if the United States gets involved, it's usually going to mess everything up, either because it's that's its intention in the first place, or because um, the goals of the U.S. are too different from the goals of whoever they've allied themselves with, and ultimately it's going to all get messed up because what the U.S. is all about is profit of big corporations. That's who runs this country. And so anybody who imagines... Uh, now or historically, that the motivations of the United States ruling class is 
something other than making money for rich people, uh, then you don't understand how history works and you don't understand how society works now and your un ability to put together a sensible narrative of history is uh, completely hampered to the point of, you know, it, it doesn't exist because you, you, can't, uh, you can't understand uh, reality without understanding class and uh, race and without understanding uh, that the United States is a country that is run by rich people who for hundreds of years ran a largely slave-based economy and now run a uh, sort of neoliberal, neo-slave economy with the global sweatshops all over the place and prison labor and, and uh, you know, this is, this is who the U.S. rules on behalf of, the, the people that run the sweatshops, not any kind of lofty whatever, you know, it's never about democracy or anything. So, I mean, that's, you know, the U.S. role in Korea is, of course, to do, uh, to support capitalism and to make sure that uh, any forces that are opposed to capitalism, whether they're, uh, you know, communist, anarchist, whatever else, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't get anywhere uh, or, 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 you know, very limited by the presence of the U.S. military and other forces, CIA, etc. Uh, but, yeah, I support the North Koreans uh, in terms of their ability to have some uh, self-determination, meaning uh, without the U.S. doing military exercises off their shores, so-called exercises. Okay, that wasn't entirely related to the third segment. That's more about the fourth segment, where we're going next week, which is going to be in the 50s. And, um, and uh, thanks for listening, and uh, please tell people about davidrovics.com slash history if you know other people who are into music and history and how these things can intersect in interesting educational ways. And thanks for listening, and um, I hope to see you next Monday for my fourth Monday morning missive. <clears throat> It'll be the same place, same time. And um, and if you happen to live in Texas uh, or Europe or somewhere else where you want to organize a gig, um, I'm looking to do gigs around anywhere in the U.S. Uh, pretty much um, through early April and also in the summer and uh, anywhere in Europe in uh, mid from mid-April to mid-June. I would love to hear from you if you're from North America or Europe and might be inclined to organize a gig. And um, even if you're watching this broadcast uh, years from now, uh, it probably all applies for this year too. So um, if this seems like a dated reference, it's not. It's just all the time. Okay, keep on keeping on. Talk to you soon. Oh, maybe I should say, if anybody has anything else to say, um, then let's see what's this. Yeah, that's that's an interesting idea, Tom Yeager. The Koreans will make peace to avoid Trump getting involved. I think it's entirely possible, actually. Well, that would be weird. Uh, that would be that would be strange if if uh, if Trump was actually successful in that strange by accident. Who knows? History can work in strange ways, as it has before. I'll give you some examples next week. Take care. Bye-bye.